um, you know, consistency from a job uh, perspective standpoint and uh, a place where also people are moving from the West Coast and from the East Coast South into those markets. Welcome to the Wealthy Mind podcast hosted by Alex Kolodinko and a good friend of mine, business partner Ashish Sanan. We are two immigrants who've come from humble beginnings to work in the Silicon Valley high-tech industry for many years, only to realize that we were trading our time for money on W-2 jobs in corporate America. Being laid off, downsized several times, watching our stock market portfolio lose significant value during each recession, paying high taxes was very frustrating. But we always knew there was a way out. Through a passionate belief in growth wealth mindset, we took massive action, started investing in commercial real estate and left our high-tech careers to build passive income with syndication investments. And now we help others like you to learn, grow and build life on your own terms. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Wealthy Mind uh, Investment uh, Podcast show. Uh, we have another guest. Uh, a good uh, friend and a fellow investor local to Bay Area, uh, Todd Zultinger. He had a very successful corporate career, being in financial uh, planning and controller, uh, working for uh, several uh, large and small corporations. And then he transitioned uh, to real estate uh, investing. And we're going to talk about uh, the importance of diversification. But before we do that, uh, uh, Todd, please introduce yourself and uh, also tell us uh, how did you get started uh, with real estate investing? Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me on your show, Alex. Yeah, we're fellow uh, Bayerians. Uh, I was actually born and raised in San Jose and went to San Jose State University. And uh, immediately after that, just dove into the corporate world, had a degree in finance and started working for a variety of technology companies here in the Bay Area. I had the chance through that process actually to live overseas. I lived in the UK for about two and a half years and got to travel a lot through Europe. So that was a great experience. So, and I had you know, a, a great career. I worked for a lot of great companies with a lot of great people. Uh, and again, I had, a, had a, a good career, mostly enjoyable. Uh, I think some of the things that caused me to transition into, the, into real estate uh, is really just a lot of the lack of control that you have when you're in a corporate environment. Uh, I, there were times where I would be working for like really great companies, uh, you know, went through several IPOs with those companies and, you know, sometimes they get acquired and they don't need two finance departments and IT and HR and all those. So, you know, then you're in a position of looking for another job. Uh, I was working for another great medical device company and they had split headquarters between Northern California and San Diego. And they transitioned all the finance to San Diego. So they said, hey, we love what you're doing. But if you want to continue to work for us, this was kind of pre-remote work. You have to move to San Diego. And as lovely as San Diego is, I didn't want to move. So after that happened a few times, uh, I decided it was I, I wanted to transition out of working in the corporate environment and was looking for how to build a business myself and you know, looked into different business, businesses and even franchises. And then through that process, discovered real estate. Very cool, very cool. And then uh, t tell us, uh, when did you learn about the commercial and passive investment? Some people are familiar with it, some of them are not. Did you actually start maybe with uh, single family homes and then transition to larger uh, commercial uh, real estate investments? Yeah, you know the process. That's what it's like. I started listening to podcasts about real estate investing and uh, as you know, it's, it's very expensive to purchase in California, and it's a very tenant-friendly state. So my first investments back in 2013 was a, a, a several single-family homes in the Dallas-Fort Worth market. Uh, you know, back then, you know, the numbers made sense. Rent, rent ratios were close to 1%, and uh, ended up buying a few turnkey properties there. Soon learned that it was going to take me a long time to be able to build up enough income from those properties uh, and enough acquisitions of properties to replace my W-2 income. And it was around 2015, 16 that I discovered this thing that we're, we're familiar with real estate syndication, you know, this idea of group investing where people can pool their money together to buy bigger assets. Um, before I did, you know, create uh, Blue Elm to start doing that, 
I invested in some passive syndications myself just to get a sense of what that process was like, what the legal process was like, um, what it's like to kind of sit on the passive investor side. And through that process, learned a lot, Some learned some of the good parts about it, as well as some of the things I uh, didn't like about it that I wanted to improve when I launched Blue Elm. Very good. Very good. So going back to your uh, corporate world, and, you know, I, I, and uh, <laughs> we share probably the same pain points when you just described earlier, you know, lack of control. Because uh, when you're in a corporate world, you go through these ups and downs of the economy, layoffs, and you get affected by it. I've been laid off several times, downsized, and sometimes you wonder, you work your butt off, and all of a sudden, it doesn't look fair, but you have no, no paycheck anymore. And you still right. have bills to pay. You have your mortgages, insurances, uh, family obligations, college uh, funds. What was your motivation factor where you said, you know what, there's got to be a better way out? Because it could be pretty uh, a decent lifestyle, especially if you work your way up to the corporate level, right? And you, you, you had a pretty uh, amazing career uh, at the corporate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. I think that's uh, that's always the hard part. I think anytime when you try to change careers at any point in time, the further you are along in your career, the more difficult it is because you're making more money and you're getting promotions. And um, but I think for me, the, I think the, the you know, and because I didn't just want to make a hard stop between saying, "Hey, I'm quitting my job and starting this new thing," I, I was fortunate enough in the last W two job that I had that I got connected with a. Uh, finance consulting company that I had hired actually to help our company fill in some gaps in our finance department. And they had really kind of built their company around people who were sometimes working part-time in finance, sometimes working full-time uh, in contract roles. And through that process, I was able to at least initially shift back to part-time at my uh, previous uh, corporate job. And at the same time, was able to start picking up consulting gigs uh, still in finance. So I was fortunate enough to be able to kind of make a slower transition, leaving a corporate job, moving into consulting, uh, and then make a transition from there. You have to start small. Uh, I think a lot of people that just want to go so aggressively, 100 miles right. an hour in. <laughs> and, you know, real estate investing, uh, it's a it's a journey. Uh, it's not an overnight success uh, <laughs> for, uh, for sure, you know, in my case, uh, I started investing a while ago and I was working uh, 40 hours at my corporate uh, tech job and uh, launched a wealthy mind investment business, uh, working sometimes additional 40 hours right, <laughs> on right. the business uh, until uh, th th there was an obstruction. But for a lot of people, you know, the, the small step could be the first investment. It could be the podcast. It could be ebook. It could be mm -hmm. a reference call. It could be attending uh, the webinar. What was uh, sort of uh, 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 the first step that you were able to take uh, to to get to get over that fear of investing in other people' uh, investments versus uh, buying your own home? Um, I think you know at least I started really with with um, going to a lot of local meetups and through the through that process met passive investors and active investors, and just started to make connections that way. This was probably, I think I made my first passive investment back in 2016. And it wasn't as easy as it is now. You know, now there's, you know, there's a lot more operators doing it. There's, uh, you know, things like CrowdStreet and other platforms where people can see passive right. investments. So I think it's easier to access them now. So when I started, it was more talking to people locally in the Bay Area who had connections, either were putting together syndications based in the Bay Area or had connections to other people in, involved in that. And it's it's difficult. You really have to kind of get to know and, and trust the person that they are bringing a deal to the table that makes sense, as well as something that you can trust them that they're going to be good stewards of your money and uh, and do well with the project. Very true. I can totally re re relate to that. Being able to meet some local people that are maybe more experienced than you are, that have done mm -hmm. several deals, and just see whether there is a good vibe, whether there is a, right. there is a connection, if there is a trust factor. Because ultimately, you trust the operator mm -hmm. and the person that you're talking to to make sure they deliver uh, on, on the business plan that they're projecting, right? End of the day, these are still risks. There are still projections, but mm -hmm. you know, we, we believe in people 
uh, that are uh, uh, able to execute uh, on on the business plan that is, that is put together. Yes, uh, for sure. What about investing uh, out of state? I know a lot of us, uh, just like what you mentioned earlier, living in the area, it's a great place, uh, and so are many other listeners invest that are living in maybe uh, expensive places such as LA, New York, mm -hmm. Jersey's uh, of the world. Uh, uh, and uh, they'd love to invest, but they're kind of hesitant to pull the trigger of uh, investing because they're not comfortable investing in uh, sort of unknown places. Although there's good trends of people that are moving yes. to out of the most expensive uh, MSAs to uh, more affordable places. What was your... Um, how were you able to uh, also overcome the fear of investing out of state? Well, it took some time for sure. Um, uh, and it, it, for me, it happened. I was going to a local meetup. Um, some of your listeners may be familiar with Robert Helms and Russell Gray of the Real Estate Guys podcast. They actually used to live here in the Bay Area and would do local meetups. And at one of those meetups, I met a turnkey provider for houses in DFW. And the real estate guys uh, put together a field trip. So I flew out to Dallas and met, you know, drove through neighborhoods, met brokers, met property managers. Um, and then it really struck me uh, one time when I was, um, I had one rental property in Sacramento, a couple hours from where we live. And I drove by the property and, you know, there was a car in front, house wasn't burned down. And I just kept driving on my way. And there was a property manager managing it. And then about a month or so after that, I was in Texas and I drove past my rental properties there. Same thing. Houses weren't burned down. They looked in good shape and I went on my way. And it really struck me that it was no different me having this house in Sacramento than it was having this house in Arlington, Texas. Yeah. And being in California, you know, the numbers are still so out of whack. People cannot create cash flow in opportunities <laughs> typically. Because the rent versus the purchase price is just don't, don't make sense. Plus, the interest yes. rates uh, uh, don't don't help uh, either. So when you start opening it up and understand that, well, you can invest out of state. You don't need to be where you are. You can enjoy where you live. And as an investor, you need to be investing where the numbers make sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? And, and, and where you have experience, a uh, partner that manages uh, this asset well. Hopefully, you've done a due diligence and did the homework on them. Yes, and I do have some investors that that still really feel like they they want to be even more active in managing their property. So they really feel like they want them close to yeah. them because they don't have a property manager and they need to be physically close to them. But if you've already decided that you don't want to be active in that way, and you can find a good property management team in any location, you can still be successful. But, but very true, and th there is no right or wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe what, what model works for one investor might not work for anybody. For some people right. that you know have a very demanding uh, tech job, or maybe they're a doctor, they don't. They might not even have time uh, to work with property management or fly out to see to see the property and then arrange financing. I mean, it's a lot of work. I, it is. It is. Yeah. I bought one uh, single family home out of state in Orlando, thinking that eventually I'll buy nine more, I'll buy ten yeah. more with my wife. And after one, I was like, you know what? I'm done. <laughs> the amount of time and effort that it took, it just it just was not working uh, for me. So I switched gears and became a passive investor in many, many syndicates. Yeah, and even when you have a, a property manager, there's many times where months go by and everything's working fine. And then, you know, I've had other horror stories where, you know, the property manager didn't put a good tenant in place. I mean, I actually had this one property in Dallas that um, after not receiving rent for a few months, property manager finally got into the property and this person had turned it into a, a place where she kind of made a strip club in her house. Oh my so God. actually put a pole in the master bedroom, painted all the walls black and was using it as a place of business. Holy so holy. <laughs> those are things that, you know, it's, you know, I love real estate. It's good. But, you know, there's sometimes when you're managing your own properties, especially in a small portfolio, when one of those goes bad, it can have a big impact on yeah, your return. You have a good uh, in my case, I actually had Airbnb because I bought it uh, as a home uh, closer to the um, uh, Disneyland, and the mm -hmm. numbers projected look awesome. 
but th there, is, there was so many houses down there that also utilized the same model that all my projections went down the drain in year one. I actually lost money. And then I said, you know what? What, what am I going to do next? And luckily, the numbers still made sense for me to hold on to it. And I switched it to a more traditional one-year lease. And uh, it's it's been doing well, uh, although I had to change tenants at one point uh, as well. And, 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 but it just goes to show you that, uh, you know, it's not as simple. It's not as rousy uh, as sometimes a lot of people think that you, know, you can just buy it and forget about it. But let's switch gears for a moment and talk about, you know, diversification. Mm -hmm. If you are an accredited investor... And you've probably been investing in a, a stock market. You have a, a decent portfolio in your 401k and maybe in uh, some of your funds also in non-retirement accounts. Uh, and uh, you're curious about real estate investing, but you, you don't have time to do a whole lot of research. You don't have time to fly out to look at the properties and look at uh, the best uh, loan options. You have a busy uh, job and career, you have a family, you have kids, you have obligations. Syndication is a great passive investment opportunity to sort of uh, enhance your portfolio with different asset classes. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that and, and yes. show us your example. How, how, how do you diversify and create multiple income streams and reduce the volatility? Because stock market, as we all know, uh, can be very volatile. Just the other day, uh, you know, First Republic Bank Silicon Valley Bank. These are yeah, right. large banks have gone from $100 uh, per stock to zero. They, yes, they have right. completely collapsed. Uh, so we all know diversification is a must, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, t t tell us more uh, why it's important and how do you go about it? Um, yeah, you know, I look at diversification, uh, you know, in the syndications I put together, as well as what I invest in passively, uh, geographic, as well as asset classes. Uh, my first syndications uh, were actually the first time I used my self-directed IRA for a real estate investment was actually for a uh, hard money loan for a uh, fourplex development in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and then after that, I invested in a commercial property in, in Plano, Texas. And these are things that, you know, I would never be able to, you know, even even comprehend what it would be like and how to manage a, a hundred thousand square foot commercial property in Texas that has, you know, its own um, lending requirements, how you get new leases for them, just all these kind of things that the only way really to have access to that, uh, you know, other than potentially going through a REIT, which you don't really, you know, have a direct investment in the asset is through a syndication. So, so I started to diversify that way. And then, you know, through that process over the years, I've invested passively in, um, in uh, self storage, in mortgage note funds, in, in apartments, in mobile home parks. So, uh, so it's a combination of asset classes and geographies. Um, personally, when I started putting together my first syndications back in 2019, I focused on mobile home parks. And one of the things I really like about the mobile home park business is there's still a huge need for affordable housing across the country and no new mobile home parks are being built or very few are being built in any particular year. If anything, they're being uh, torn down or, or redeveloped. So from an affordable housing perspective, uh, I, I like uh, mobile home parks. Um, since that time, I put together syndications for uh, multifamily for apartments, uh, as well as RV parks that are more on the recreation side. So you can do it as a, as a uh, I know there are many syndicators that focus on one specific asset class that they specialize in. Other ones are more diversified. Um, and then definitely from the passive side, I would su you know, suggest to anybody who wants to invest passively in real estate to look at multiple asset classes for that diversification. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so, some people are familiar, maybe many are not. Uh, Tiger 21 uh, is, is an organization that actually tracks the portfolio allocation type. What do wealthy people invest like that have five, 10, 25 million dollar, you know, net worth? And it's mm -hmm. it's interesting to say we're not bashing stocks here. That I think it's important to have allocation uh, to the stock market, but the typical allocation to the stock market is about 20, 25 percent, and 25 percent. Yeah. In private equity and, and, and real estate, 
uh, and this is so different uh, if you think yes. about it. It's so different versus what, what's the typical allocation that financial advisor recommends. Yeah, and I think part of it is that it's so easy to get started. You start a job and your company has a 401k or you want to open a brokerage account and you can start with hardly any money at all. Uh, whereas right. if you want to get into uh, syndications, yeah, you got to have a, uh, you know, oftentimes you have to be accredited and you have to have more more wealth right. established before you do that. So there is there are barriers like that. Um, and that's, I think, where I think that's a, a telling sign that Tiger 21 study that says that people that have really built large amounts of wealth that are really trying to build legacy wealth for themselves and their families look at alternative investments, including real estate. Yes, so true. And then uh, as you progress in your career and you start to accumulating more wealth, you also start paying attention to taxes, right? Because, you know, looking back uh, at your corporate uh, world uh, career and, and so are mine, you know, making two, three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year sounds great until you see, wait a second, yeah. 30, 40, 50 percent of my taxes is gone. Yes. And then you, you're realizing that, well, that's not going to work if you continue in the, in the trajectory. What if you could make a little bit less or sometimes more after you accumulate in that and, and become good at the investing world and then you pay zero you you could potentially pay zero taxes and it's in absolutely legal uh, on top of that there is a deferral component right mm -hmm. not only you're 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 not paying any taxes during uh, your accumulation phase but you can continuously defer that uh, pretty much indefinitely through tax mm -hmm. deferral 1031 yeah. exchanges and uh, tenants in, in, in common option. That, that was a game changer for me. Yes, I agree. I mean, real estate is magic that way. I mean, I remember having conversations before I was started investing in real estate with uh, CPAs that I've had and say, oh, is there anything I can do to reduce taxes? And all they could say was, oh, you could put more in your 401k, max out your 401k or your IRA. I mean, that was it. There was no other advice or way to save taxes when you're generating W-2 income. Right. Yeah. That, 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 that's huge. By the way, what is your uh, favorite asset class right now uh, when it comes to uh, commercial real estate? Uh, yeah, I think my favorite, my favorite right now is, is right now with multifamily. Um, I just think when, when I look at the trends for the need for housing uh, just across the country, we're just still not building enough housing to, to house all the people that are that are forming households at this point, um, you know, that combined with higher interest rates, higher home cost to purchase a home, it's going to leave people that uh, still want to have a, 